everyone thanks for your patience there um i believe we're now ready to start the webinar um so welcome uh, my name is andrew nori i'm the commercial director at 3d repo um i guess i'll just be hosting today's webinar um with us today we've got james bowles who is a 4d consultant at freeform and the founder of zero uh, he'll be explaining more about that as we go through the presentation along with tasha greenfield who is a design coordinator at natural building systems uh, and then from the 3D repo side, we've also got Mia, our implementation manager, who will be taking you through the main part of the presentation and the live demo. So for the agenda today, um, I'm going through introductions now. Um, we'll then hand over to Zero to set the scene a bit, explain what they do and explain what the problem is that we're trying to solve, I guess. Um, then I'll come back. We've got quite a mixed audience today um, and a lot of new faces by the looks of it. Um, so we'll explain a bit about what the 3D Repo platform is and what we're trying to achieve. And then we'll go into the, the crux of the presentation, um, which is Mia taking on the, the BIM to zero question about how we can visualize carbon in a BIM world. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So within the... Um, Zoom platform, there's plenty of space for you to answer questions. You can put them in the chat or you can put them directly in the Q&A section. We'll pick them up. I'll be monitoring them as we go through the presentation. Uh, if anything interesting comes up, I might stop someone during it just to, to answer a question or if there's a bit of blank space to do that. If not, we'll save them all up for the end and we'll have a good Q&A session at the end where there'll be some live questions as well. Uh, we do have some polls in today's webinar. Um, so I'm going to kick off the first one of those now. Uh, which is looking at how actively you currently interact with BIM models on your projects. Um, so it's really, do you, don't you, or you don't use BIM at all? Um, we're just trying to get a feel for how BIM literate people are, or even how, how much access people have to the data on their projects. Uh, so I'm just going to launch that now. And while that's going, uh, you can answer those questions. I will hand over to uh, James, I believe. Um, who can steal the screen share and start the first presentation introducing uh, Zero? Um, thanks, well, James. Yeah, the, yeah, can you hear me? Can you? Yep. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, thanks, Andrew. Tasha, are you joining me for this first bit? Yes, I'm okay, here. Fantastic. So we haven't rehearsed this at all. So <laughs> I'm going to share screen. Uh, one second there and we're gonna yeah we'll talk through and introduce what zero is and yeah then at some point we'll hand over to you Mia and we'll kind of yeah we'll just run the session so um so the the first point to make here is that zero is focused on embodied carbon so everything through the extraction processing assembly transport and construction of our built environment um some basic numbers there at the top um, no doubt most of you know these numbers already. Uh, construction of buildings and infrastructure uh, accounts for about 4 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. That's obviously a significant figure. It's obviously something that we can all do something about, those of us who are engineers and planners and construction managers. And uh, it's also 12% of all human emissions. So I don't know, Tasha, you want to add anything to that, but just big numbers. Yeah. Big numbers, and I think, I mean, it's it's up there on the screen is why we need to change how we're building buildings. Yeah, perfect. Okay, and then, and then so, uh, quick backstory. So we, uh, a few of us started uh, just WhatsApping about a year ago as to what we could all do better uh, individually, um, how we could encourage change, how we could do more than just uh, run through our projects in the way we run through our projects, uh, focused on safety, time and cost. Carbon's obviously uh, something we need to work on and maybe it's something that we as those who build stuff can, can support change more. So if I try and talk around this and Tasha just jump in at any one point, uh, we've we've grown quite rapidly. It's been it's been really encouraging to see that growth. Um, but I'll talk about all the things we're doing. So we do a little bit of social media. You may have seen us on LinkedIn. You may have seen us on Twitter. We'll do a bit more of that as we grow. We have a future leaders program, Zero Next. So Tasha, I don't know if you wanted to say something on that. 
Yeah, well, so, I mean, it, it kind of goes with the introduction of Zero, but when um, we started, so I got involved with Zero. Um, so I work at Natural Building Systems um, and we designed and built the standard ECW. And when I got involved, I think I was probably one of the youngest, if not the youngest person in Zero and talking to Zero. And it seemed like a weird thing that we were talking about the future and actually the people that were talking about the future were all kind of uh, middle-aged and actually, sorry, James, uh, okay. but actually it's the young professionals and, and the people who are just starting in industry now that are going to be leading industry when all of the things that we're talking about come into fruition. I mean, hopefully these things come about sooner, but um, that was where Zero Next was born. Um, and I think Zero Next is also kind of a nice little safe space where all of us radicals can can say things and not worry about saying the wrong thing and, and making silly mistakes. So, um, so off the back of that, if you do know anyone or if you know anyone who you would consider a future leader, or are we, are we saying under 30, Tasha? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, originally we were saying anyone who would consider themselves a kind of young radical, but actually then we were getting applicants who were 50 year old men and we have to say no to those. Uh, so yeah, okay, under 30. So, so yeah, feel free to, we'll, we'll, Andy, uh, me, I think we have links in the chat at some point, we're gonna put some links in, so feel free to follow those. Um, a few other things, we're entirely independent. We have no parent, we have no, this isn't a government initiative. It's just a bunch of people doing things in their spare time. Uh, we're not- I think If I can jump in on that independent note, it, I think that means that we're not, we don't have to be careful what we say. We can say, we can kind of be really open and honest about what's going on. And we don't have to worry about pleasing uh, someone at the top, which is always nice. Yeah, we, we, we don't sit within any framework. We've got no uh, constraints on what we do, say, and, and yeah. Uh, we're currently building a low carbon framework, uh, playbook. There are obviously others out there, as is um, gonna be going into quite a lot of depth on body carbon. So um, we're looking at innovations. Uh, a, a lot of our, our group are from innovation backgrounds, startup founders, uh, probably people on this call, same kind of thing. We've got maybe 20% sustainability uh, expertise. So uh, an interesting mix of people. Um, we're, yeah, something like 400 members in 40 countries. That probably needs updating again because it's growing. And the working groups, um, I'll talk about those in uh, a minute. But yeah, they're, they're, they're great fun. Uh, we have a few sponsors and partners. And we're physically at events. I think, Tasha, we're at seven events over the next eight months or something. So we are um, out and about physically as well as things like this. So yeah, that's that's enough about zero. Um, uh, the the overall. So the yeah, I mean the workshops have been very active. We've we've had uh, a few hundred people have come to maybe 15, 20 of these workshops. They've been quite scattered. Um, but what we're doing now in phase two of our work is starting to stream these into the groups you'd expect to see. So everything from leadership to construction. And from that, we are building a public facing playbook. And that playbook is, is a very wide angle view on the solution to embodied carbon. So we're not just talking about the chemistry of concrete um, and uh, the processing of low carbon steel. We actually want to understand what changes we need to make um, on leadership, on mindset, procurement, supply chain, um, all, all of those uh, and measurements, certainly, which we'll come on to in a minute, but that we, we want to build the widest possible angle view on the solution and share that with that solution with as many people as possible. So, yeah, I, I, without going into this, I think that's the point where we just hand over to Mia, if that's okay, Mia, or, or I, I might just take one more minute to say that the solution we're going to see here and the work that 3D Reef are, do, are doing is one essential pillar in the the, the whole uh, playbook or framework so it's it's essential and it's yeah, it's a part of the solution that's it from us Andy if that's okay perfect I guess I can take over now uh, I'm going to share my screen all right so uh, visualizing carbon bin to zero uh, thank you, James uh, and Tasha, for the introduction. 
Uh, I guess we're here to talk about how can we make embodied carbon more visible. So how will we manage uh, carbon data uh, so that project teams have information to support decisions with the available technologies. And I guess that the main topic for today is just to sort of talk about 3D repos contribution in, in that huge topic. So it's worth maybe just uh, talking a little bit about carbon. It's the fiber in your hair, it's the timber in your walls, the food that you eat, uh, and the air that you breathe. Um, and so in his book, Symphony in C and the Evolution of Almost Everything, Robert Hazen declares it as the most adaptable and most essential element of all. And it might even be the greatest measure of understanding the world around us. Yet, we're becoming more familiar with this word, to decarbonize. So you also notice the pattern. So it's about this reduction to remove or reduce carbon dioxide output into the atmosphere. So now while we think about this word as a verb, I also want us to think about it as an objective, as a goal by addressing uh, more calls for actions. And this will form also the uh, basis of the agenda for today. So I'm gonna first start by defining carbon and I'm gonna talk about why we need to measure it uh, how we can visualize it and how we can address it. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if uh, you can uh, add any questions that you want and we'll uh, cover that towards the end. So first let's start with the what and why. Uh, why do we need to define carbon? Because we simply cannot improve what we cannot define. So we'll start defining. And if we look at carbon's impact on the universe and the cosmic history since the beginning of everything, I think we just got to ask ourselves this question, how have we managed to alter the cycle uh, with our human cause in this condition so much that we need to act? Um, so part of our ecological footprint is in fact our carbon footprint. And if I get some numbers and figures here, um, I'm not really inventing anything, you can see the source. We've been emitting so much this century that the earth has been getting warmer than it has been over the past 40,000 years causing imbalance in the whole ecosystem. So 39%, that's almost like a third of the total global emissions come from the built environment alone, all of which, um, and 31% of this is coming from materials alone. So really the urge to reduce our emissions means that we need to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's another figure, um, just to give you an idea. So if I achieve 20% structural embodied carbon reduction in just one building, that's how much you can save per year. And that's just structural, um, the structure in a building. So this was adapted from the Institution of Structural Engineers. Uh, and I'm going to get back to the source again in a, in a moment. So there's a room for everyone for, to start acting. If I'm in design, what can I do? Maybe you're wondering if you're in construction, what can you do? Well, you can start by managing and optimizing the material selection if you're in design and if you're in construction, you can plan, implement and report. So optimizing temporary works design, site management, site management and managing the supply chain. And obviously uh, start to report and document this. We're gonna review this in a bit as well. So I just wanna know how I can do it. Now we're gonna cover how we can measure carbon um, because we cannot improve what we cannot measure. And so we'll start me measuring. Um, just to start with this, that was adapted from an ISO. Um, our framework here is in four phases uh, and as such. So first we start by establishing a goal or a target. For example, you want to demonstrate compliance within a specific building regulation. Then we calculate the resources from the collected inputs. And in the third phase, you will need to evaluate and compare that data to existing scenarios. So it's the life cycle impact assessment. And then last but not least, is the actual interpretation of those results. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into those phases without remaining highly technical. So for example, if we want to set the target and locate our project in this mapping, uh, knowing that the global target is to hit zero by 2050. So we can choose a, base, a baseline model to compare it to, and that could be a historical project or your design versus construction, um, anything really. So you need to then pick these objects of assessment so the building components can be included. 
Um, I don't think there is a universal indication about the LCA, life cycle assessment, but typically it'd be components such as roof, columns, beams, floors, walls. So we're talking at the, the design level. Um, and it's also worth mentioning the tools and methods available out there. So the next step is to choose a reference guide. And trust me, there are plenty. I think most recently, the past 2080 uh, was released. I think uh, BSI is doing something to publish it. Um, and then you can look at all the other um, British standards or even international standards. And these basically form the backbone of the SCA methodology. Also, recently designers, contractors, and even our clients are using some LCA tools to measure embodied carbon. Um, so some are publicly accessible online for industry-wide stakeholder uh, to evaluate their project's uh, carbon emission against the benchmark and to measure and evaluate uh, carbon, uh, carbon performance on the go. So for example, I'm just gonna show you a um, little bit of these tools, just a, a quick glance. Um, so if you're asking yourself which one you should use, I think there is no one tool or platform that solves the whole problem. Uh, you've got to ask yourself, what is it that you're trying to solve? What's the specific use case? So for example, um, this one, EC3, it's a free cloud-based tool uh, in, on buildingtransparency.org. So we can make informed choices by selecting materials that lower climate impact. So if in your case, you've got a very detailed material libraries, you can make use of this tool. Um, for our um, Hong Kong audience, so we've got uh, our clients in Hong Kong that use the CIC assessment tool. It's also online on the web browser, and it allows you to dynamically input the materials with a detailed analysis and benchmarking. Uh, one of the most popular, uh, popular and sophisticated Excel tools out there, especially in the UK, is the ICE, Inventory of Carbon and Energy. Uh, so in this case, you can just download it uh, online and just uh, it will perform the calculations for you. Another example would be Sterling. Um, it's a software uh, to correlate uh, resource cost and carbon value for instant carbon calculation. I think here the advantage is that you could then potentially integrate the, the whole thing for potential takeoffs that you do using 3D repo, for example. Um, and then uh, another one would be the one-click LCA. It's a Revit plugin. Uh, also, one of our customers uh, use it, uses it. Um, so you can comply here with the regulations and follow your region's taxonomy based on where you are in the world. So you can calculate that uh, from your Revit model directly and choose the categories to export. Um, so you get the, the idea. But after picking all this, I think we need to start defining the system boundary. Um, are we choosing to include all the modules? Do we have even data for all those modules? I think as a best practice scope, um, it's life cycle stages from A to D. So we kind of want to you know, uh, cover it all and also beyond the life cycle. So looking at beyond the system boundary. But um, most, um, most commonly, uh, I think everyone um, has kind of data for uh, A1 to A5 process, so that would be cradle to practical completion, uh, including the transportation. But there are some gaps. So I'm, I'm not gonna you know, teach you some math, but just to simplify it and tell you how easy it is. This is a fundamental principle for conducting life cycle assessments. Okay, so it's the basic formula, but keep in mind that some of the modules here are really mentioned. The idea is to tell you that the carbon factor is given, whereas the quantities are obtained for your, from your uh, calculations. And you can look up online for more details. So at 3D Repo, we opted for the following process, and we're really not reinventing the wheel. I think the main thing uh, to remember is that you have to account for an iterative process. So inputs will feed into the process of calculating, analyzing, and communicating the results with the design team. So um, independently from where you got your data sources from, whether you're using EPDs or uh, materials, um, and independently of what that data format is, so whether it's a CSV or it's just an API where you're making a query from somewhere, once you have, your, you have extracted your uh, data and you have added your material quantities, you can start this process of 
okay, calculating, analyzing, communicating once, and then you do it a second time, um, you know, as a second scenario, as a second option, and you do it as much as you need to. So the idea here is that we want to start comparing different options. Um, but in summary, these tools can help us weigh options and make decisions by measuring the impact of the design choices. And I think it's a little bit enough with the boring stuff. I'm just going to go back to the BIM side of things. And let's ask ourselves this question. Coordinating your BIM models and collaborating with your clients is great. But what if you could visualize your carbon data on top? So what if you recycle your existing BIM models to map out the carbon results directly in 3D report or in 3D and in one place? And what if we're actually able to also streamline that data by connecting those sources together as well? So we're going to start by visualizing carbon, and I'm literally going to show you how. We can track and report the embodied figures and on demand and leverage them now as a design decision making tool. So the visibility of carbon is essential because we cannot improve what we cannot see and we cannot improve what we cannot uh, communicate. So this is just uh, one example of the three method methods that 3D Repo was able to highlight. Um, and we looked at the Power BI uh, queries that we merged with 3D Repo data. So we can map out those external carbon outputs and then see that in uh, a Power BI dashboard. So that's the first method, right? So you have an API call and an external query that you merge into Power BI. The second method would be not really ideal. Some, some of our clients might be exploring this right now. It's uh, offline, it's highly manual. And you look, look at the number of steps that you have. So you've got your external carbon data, you're writing a Dynamo script. Not everyone might be that tech savvy or that Revit savvy. Um, and then from that point, you push those parameters into your Revit model. Then you push that to 3D repo. And this is where you can start uh, informing your team and look at project reporting. It's not really ideal, but it's doable. And the third method, it's the preferred, and this is what's coming soon at 3D Repo, and I'm going to give you a glance at what uh, this is. It's basically bringing a custom data to 3D Repo. It could be from a CSV file that's uh, common. It could come from uh, another data source, um, from an API, an X SQL, or any other external database that you have. But the idea here is that you're directly pushing it into 3D Repo, and then you're visualizing the whole thing in Power BI. So you really reduce the double handling from all sides. So Mia, I might just yeah. stop you there quickly and skip back to the section that we missed about what 3D Repo is, because yeah. you're talking about it. I'm just worried that we have got quite a few people on this call that might be new to 3D Repo. So I'm just going to steal the screen share for a minute and just talk through sure. a couple of really quick slides just to explain to people uh, what the platform is, and then we can go into a bit more detail about how you've been using it. Uh, so if I just share my screen again. Um, so yeah, I think the first thing that we need we need to be clear on here is that 3D Repo is a is a platform designed for managing uh, BIM models and the data that sits behind them. Um, we're not here trying to promote a carbon tool per se. Uh, measuring carbon is one of the workflows that you can get out of, or measuring materials and volumes is is one of the things that you can get out of 3D Repo and then combining that with other data and building out templates and, and dashboards is something that users can do. It's, it's not a product out of the box that we're selling. So 3D Repo as a product is, is a cloud-based tool that takes BIM models, puts them into a database and allows you access to the data within those models for various purposes. And we've built a number of products on top of this development platform. The main one being 3D Repo IO, which is our, our flagship product for BIM coordination, which Mia will be showing during her demonstration that can do things like data validation, 4D visualization, uh, and all your normal clash detection. Uh, we also have built other tools that you can simulate on top, like uh, PlanBase, which is for uh, community engagement, so publicly facing models, uh, and 3D Send, which is a free tool for sharing 3D models across the web. Uh, these are all things that people can build themselves because we do have direct links in with things like Unity and Unreal. And these tools, again, could be used to combine carbon data within a, within a digital twin environment. But all this is really powered by our API. Um, so our open API allows us to integrate with many things. One of those things being Power BI, but it could be other things like SharePoint, databases, IoT tools, that type of thing. Um, 
but we're going to be concentrating on the Power BI side of things today. Uh, it's something that we've been developing out for a while that you can now embed your models directly within your Power BI dashboard and combine it with data either from 3D Repo. So in this case, we're looking at level data, materials data, and issues that have been raised within the 3D Repo platform and combining them within to the 3D model and linking that data together. Uh, but what Mia is going to be looking at is how uh, we could, in effect, add external data into that database with the models from 3D Repo. So things like external databases of information, CSV files and information, uh, information from IoT devices um, to be able to, to give a, a richer picture of what's going on in your project. In this case, we're very specifically obviously looking at carbon data. Um, and then the other workflow she was talking about is that we could inject that data directly into the 3D repo platform to be able to see it within the 3D model directly and then push that into Power BI. Um, so I hope that just gives a, a really quick overview of what 3D repo as a platform does. Um, I'll, I'll hand back over to you now, Mia, just to carry on with the, with the live demo portion. Uh, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, same, I'll share my screen again. Um, yeah, so we were looking at this graph, but um, I actually want to show you something else now. It's um, this dashboard, right? So it looks like something like this, and this is method one. Uh, so what I did here is I basically brought my 3D model. I can just navigate. You've noticed these colors, and these colors come from either a custom column that I created uh, in, in Power BI, or some data validation smart groups, which we call in 3D repo, um, which are uh, groups um, having different rule sets. Um, and they basically give you an idea of uh, how you can validate that data. And uh, they, you can basically start to color code your model based on that rule. So in this case, if I'm clicking, uh, let's say I want to bring only the columns. So that's going to give me, that's going to highlight the total embodied carbon figures for the, the columns only. So you start to filter that model however you want, and it will extract all the carbon figures as well. So you understand a little bit more the cost. So just um, as an overview, um, so if I'm clicking maybe steel rebar, let's say, so you get the idea. But as an overview, um, we're using here the Institution for Structural Engineers uh, database. Um, it's an online uh, Excel spreadsheet that you can download. Anyone can access it. I thought it made sense in this case because I'm just uh, mapping the structural model. I'm not doing anything else. So it made sense to use uh, their own material specification. So all those figures, all those numbers come actually from that database. So 3D Repo is not the one calculating this, but once you have your calculation, you can uh, start to visualize this and inform your design teams about which are the most, uh, let's say, uh, carbon heavy uh, elements. So for example, here, it's very clear that my foundations are pro problematic, uh, whereas maybe this topography or this uh, landscaping in here is actually maybe carbon neutral. Um, so without diving deeper into this, I'm just going to go back to my slides. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this, which is basically, oops. So this is the first methodology, which is exactly what I just showed you. Um, and how do we start? Basically, we have access for, to our Institution of um, Structural Engineers database that looks at all structural elements. We have our materials. Um, we did our energy breakdown. We calculated our embodied carbon. And on the other side, we have our uh, you know, online repository, which is 3D Repo that hosts that 3D model that comes from Revit or any of the supported formats. 
Um, and then we're doing two queries, basically. The first one is a, a query that brings in the data from that external source. And the second one is an API query that brings um, the model data and the model information into Power BI. So when we join these, we're able to uh, look at the feedback, you know, um, inform about the data gaps, uh, highlight some new data, some new trends that we're able to find. Um, so this is just a, another glance through the, the Power BI dashboard. Um, and so some of the benefits when pulling this data on demand now are that you can review the applied carbon factors and override your values. So you can keep on reiterating your material selection as much as you need um, in your revisions until you are satisfied with the results. And once this is set up, you don't need to change anything, right? Because all, you, all it takes is basically a, a new uh, revision upload into 3D repo, and you're able to pull that latest data on demand. So it will allow you to quickly compare carbon impacts on your design model. Now, this is uh, method three, which is um, basically if you have an external data set, data set let's say it, this is a CSV file that contains all of my sustainability information. Uh, I've got not only the embodied carbon figures, but I've got my unique ID for each element. Uh, I've got also the um, each phase, each module from A1 to A5 or even D. And what, what, what happens now is that I can start, you know, doing some quantity takeoffs or some data validation using smart groups. So I'm going to show you as well how this works. Um, so. Um, so if I bring up my BIM card, this is where we store all the model metadata. It's the same model that you're looking at that I was demonstrating. So if I click on just one floor, uh, I can access all of my uh, model information, all the metadata. But on top of this, I can favorite the ones that I just need for my use case. In this case, it's sustainability. This is not a parameter that exists within my Revit model. It's basically coming from a CSV file that I was able to push directly and append to my model. So in this case, we're kind of saving you time to input the parameters on Revit or another authoring tool, and you can directly put it into 3D repo. It's still independent, but you can also start to visualize your, um, your project based on those figures, and you can create those rule sets however you want to um, depending on how you want to validate that. So for example, if I want to just like highlight a few of these, uh, I can look at all these uh, columns, for example. In this case, I'm looking at this very specific um, total embodied carbon factor uh, from A1 to A5 and give me all the numbers that are uh, lower uh, than 0.2. Um, so you can start adding your rules however you want. Um, on top of other compliance checks that you're doing, so for example, this was just a normal compliance check that I wanted to look at for the Omni class in the columns, and um, I can still, you know, uh, on top of this, uh, visualize where in relationship to that compliance check, where do I have uh, some embodied carbon uh, figures as well. Um, so you get the idea, and based on that data that you have, you can start validating this. And on top of this, you can use PD repo as if you were using it for any other use case. So you can start mapping out this. You can say, these are the columns missing. So that was an existing issue that was raised. Columns um, missing figures in the sustainability report. You can communicate that with your design teams and so on. Um, if you didn't know where your, uh, where your analysis is and what were the different uh, groups that were saved, you can also access a, a 3D view that was created previously, so you never lose the information and we always direct you to the specific viewpoint. So this is basically in summary to what you can do. I'm going to do a very quick example and go back to my slides. So let's say now we're actually looking maybe at these columns, OK? Um, and what I want is I maybe I want to look at the specific material type uh, specification. So what I'll do is I'll create a new group, um, and I'll call it uh, material specs. Um, it's a smart group, and I can copy that rule set, come in here, paste my filters, 
there you go. So this is my field, uh, which translates into the operation is, and I want to make a query to get this value. So if I save it, now it's going to give me, so all those groups with, so as you can see, it highlighted these columns. So all those columns that have this specific material spec. So you get the idea and it becomes a very uh, powerful tool because once you have your carbon data, you can then map it out. And uh, it doesn't stop here. You can now share it with someone else. You can download it. Uh, you can import and export to just transfer that information over to other models. That could be your other scenario, your other option. Um, and all of this has also an API. So you could even automate the creation of these groups as well, if you have the rule sets. So now I'll go back to the slides. Um, this is what I just showed you. Um, and so it gives you a taste for design optioneering, right? So as I was saying, we can compare the same design in four different hypothetical options of different material selection. So from scenario A to scenario D, what we've done is we altered the materials. And so every time we were uploading a new revision, we were able to instantly track how much we were saving uh, in budget carbon. So we go from very generic materials such as concrete, average rebar to let's say rammed earth and straw insulation. Um, and we get to a point where we are even carbon negative. So this is all highly uh, hypothetical, but it informs your design team. So in scenario uh, A, it's a, it's a high embodied carbon scenario where you have, you're using common materials that have really high carbon footprint. Uh, in scenario B, that's more of a typical, you know, in the industry, this is something that, you know, you're, you're choosing a less uh, in, intensive set of materials and get that figure down by almost a half. So in the industry, I think people are targeting for this. Um, the best conventional would be scenario C. In that case, that's the closest to what we call a zero carbon building. Um, it's because we can even make better choices using commonly available code compliant materials. And in the last case, in scenario D, this is the best uh, carbon drawdown. So this means that the building actually stores more carbon than it emits. And the amount of carbon stored in the plant-based materials can be significantly higher than the emissions uh, created to harvest and produce the material. Might sound counterintuitive, but again, that's supposed to be a little bit thought provoking and just highly conceptual. So you can understand that one of these scenarios can be a baseline that enables the tracking of changes over time and across projects. So we've seen how we can visualize embodied carbon calculations in 3D models. We've in included those carbon metrics in the BIM process. We reduce double handling efforts. And we saw that depending on how it's uh, manufactured, a building component can have much lower embodied carbon factor than another that looks and performs the same. Um, and basically the strategies for embodied carbon reductions, such as material choices are what actually reduces the embodied carbon of the building. So you can use tools such as, uh, and technologies such as 3D Repo to highlight this and visualize this, but we will never give you the answer. And so measuring also does not reduce, it's choosing the material. Um, and hopefully you'll walk out of the session a little bit more motivated. We're gonna see now how we can address carbon because it's important to talk about the impact uh, of what we're doing. And you know, these are other ways that we can address carbon. I think um, we might be having a poll coming up, Andrew. Uh, I'm just gonna pause here for a moment. Uh, yeah, we can have a poll. Uh, so we're gonna be asking if you have a strategy for mapping embodied carbon at the moment. Uh, good results there. Looks like mostly no, but a good few yeses. Uh, thanks very much for your answers there. Uh, just wait for a few more to come in. Then we'll do one more, I think, while we're stopped for a sec. I'm just going to end that poll there. Thanks very much for participating. And the next one is, what is the biggest challenge for visualizing carbon data?
to well, four, well, four choices, getting the data right in the first place, choosing the right tool for the right project, or lack of awareness around the importance of such challenges, uh, or all of the above. Um, looks like at the moment, the biggest one, Mia, is getting the data right in the first place with about 53%. Um, Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I'm just gonna, so last part of the presentation really is just talking a little bit about how to address carbon in relationship to also what's going on in the industry. So it's important to talk about that. Um, because we cannot manage what we cannot address. So, we're going to start addressing and we're going to see how we can design for zero. So this is a, just another uh, fancy graph of this circular economy principle about embracing the concept of you know, uh, zero. And we find these nice diagrams a bit everywhere. I think that you can ask yourself if you can be that person that puts this uh, abstraction into practice. And uh, remember that digitization can be a catalyst for avoiding overproduction as well. So you see that digitization is actually at the heart of that uh, diagram. Um, so no matter where you are in this uh, supply chain or in, uh, you know, what, no matter what your role is, whether you're involved in production and distribution, design for circula circularity, sourcing the materials, um, maintenance and repair, you get it, like no matter where you are, I think that you gotta start asking yourself the question and feel like you are responsible, responsible for creating that data in the first place. So for example, if you are on site, you know, uh, you need to basically drive that. And you guys have highlighted it, that you know, data is lacking and you cannot get to a nice analysis and fancy graphs and you know, a, a nice visualization if you don't have the data in the first place. And currently there is a big gap. So why there's this big gap as well? Most of the people, and this is also adapted from the past uh, 2080, most of the people think that at the planning phase, we have so many uncertainties and inaccuracy from our calculations that we're often not motivated to just do it. Um, this is a, a completely wrong thinking because you should make carbon your default construction. You should think about your loading, your capacity. You should think the, you know, uh, we need to really measure our buildings to understand how they perform. And we cannot measure them if we don't have that data. And in fact, if you're at the planning phase, at the very, very beginning, when you think that you cannot make an impact, actually this is where you can, because, those inaccuracies will get reduced over time. You know, if you don't have access to that data today, you might uh, have access to it tomorrow. But you really need to reframe the whole strategy about this carbon reduction potential. And so, as you move through your project, you know, you will be able to eliminate waste. You will be able to build more clever. Um, and so. In terms of the recommendations, I think that it's very clear that the impact that you can make on climate change is real and it's significant. You should have a reduction goal and a data strategy. And the tools for uh, carbon measurements are available and you should start making use of them. Then figure out the information consistency. So I've seen clients that are complaining that this tool doesn't give them you know, the right calculation, or it might be that it's the wrong tool. It doesn't mean that the technology isn't available. So you should spend more time in the planning phase to make sure you make the right choices early. And it will cost you less money to do it in early phases as well. You adopt a technology that identifies waste and going carbon neutral means uh, a revolution in the way we live. So I'll leave it just here for you to digest what we just said. Um, calling for action, act now, not later. And you know we're waiting for you if you wanna hop on this journey with us. Um, and that's it. Awesome work, thanks Mia. Um, if we can bring everyone back now, we'll go through some Q and A. Uh, I've got a fair few to go through. Um, just find it. 
Yeah, so there's quite a few uh, very 3D repo related ones. So I'm just going to go through some of those now. Um, so there's a lot about whether 3D, whether this would be suitable for something that isn't a building project. Um, I, I don't see any reason why not. That I think that it's been very focused on Revit just because they're the examples that we have to hand. Um, but 3D repo is used on a lot of infrastructure projects. So it supports formats like Bentley, Navisworks, uh, Synchro, um, DWG for uh, Civils 3D. Um, so it is more than possible. It's just the access to example data for us that we can show in public is, uh, is tends to be always Revit based. Um, there's a question in option three, you map directly the carbon data to the BIM objects. Yes. So there is a new API coming in 3D repo that will allow you to inject uh, data into the 3D repo data model um, and map it to it. So that could be anything from carbon data to logistics data, to the, which was another one of the questions is what about the logistics data? Um, yes, that could be modeled in 4D and then extracted that way, or the data could just be added to the object around how the logistics are going to work for it um, or link to your, your external logistics platform, whatever you're using for that at the moment. Uh, yes, 3D repo is 100% cloud based, so it's accessed through the web browser and hosted on AWS. Uh, all right, so let's get to some of the more interesting ones now. Uh, we are sharing a recording. Uh, do we have a list of the LCA software this is compatible with? Uh, Mia? So I guess most of the LCAs that are available out there are just Excel tools. So it's just uh, people think that it's sophisticated. If it's just an Excel uh, spreadsheet, then yes, you can very easily bring that information into 3D repo. Now, if you have a, a, an LCA that is a software, if they have an open API that we can connect to, we can. I don't see why we couldn't integrate with them. Uh, 3D repo has an open API. So for us, it's not a problem. And if you have a project, you know, in partnership, uh, or if you're developing, you know, uh, an, an LCA strategy with one of those software, then we can for sure have a discussion with them. Yeah. And how full and complete are the embodied carbon databases for all construction products? And does anyone know if the data is verified and reliable where does it come from maybe one for the zero guys Tasha would you like to go first <clears throat> and then I can and well I think I mean so in terms of I'm I'm no expert on LCAs but in terms of the carbon analysis that we've done of our system there are I'd say it's probably people who like to think that they're sustainable tend to have LCAs and and stuff kind of EPDs done that have the kind of LCA analysis in them um, but products that aren't as sustainable don't you know there's no in terms of having EPDs done there's no legislation that says you have to have an EPD done um, so an environmental product declaration um, and without that it's really hard I think there's also I mean there's a my boss is a complete expert on this and there's lots of conversations about LCA methodology and how you measure carbon um, and, and lots of LCA methodology is slightly different. So this idea of circularity and end of life and how you deal with end of life. So as a complete non-expert, I find it quite hard to look at kind of lifetime carbon analysis data and understand it really easily. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure whether that really answers the question or just poses another question of uh, how reliable it is. I'm not sure is the answer. So, so Tasha, I've actually put that question to our WhatsApp group of about 100 experts, and they're probably just getting to debate about this. So yeah. it's a work in progress, it's in development, a lot of people are working on it. Um, you'd imagine in a few years, a lot of these things will be settled on trustworthiness, consistency, et cetera. So yeah, def definitely not complete, yeah. Yeah. Um... A couple more 3D repo related questions. Yes, we support IFC and that's how we also support Tecla. Um, anyone want to jump on what is the best automated tool for measurement of carbon for civil projects, non Revit designs? No. Uh, 
I guess that the same the same workflow would apply to a DWG file as it would to a Revit file, as long as the data is embedded within the file. Um, the same workflow that, that Mia has been outlining there could work with with that. Um, okay, let's have something a bit meatier. So, James, out of all of the um, kind of modules that you outlined in your presentation, which one do you think people can have the greatest impact in? at the moment or where should people be starting uh, the, oh, yeah good question it depends on their background and what they would like from zero so we've got um probably the most appropriate for this call and, and Mia, what you've talked about today would be the innovation group which is actually happening at the same time as this webinar so i'm kind of watching the update live which is interesting um yeah so joining the innovation group joining the design and construction groups i mean but basically just register and we'll get in touch with you. So yeah, they, they're obviously, we've, we've obviously streamed the groups, but we don't want to silo them. So we don't want to say that, I mean, uh, again, Mia, you've touched on a whole load of points here that would span all of those streams because some of them are mindset shift. Some of them are actually measuring, estimating, reporting. So yeah, yeah, and, and innovation as well, because you're kind of, there's, there's a lot of, I put you in a space where you're innovating and you're kind of cutting new ground. So, yeah, that doesn't really answer it. <laughs> I just, yeah. I think I just wanted to say from an external uh, point of view. So I uh, try to join the zero chats. I am not the best at attending all of them, but when I do, I think it's uh, highly valuable. So I really encourage any one of you here um, just to, yeah, don't be shy, just register your interests. And then whenever you're available, you can join. You, you won't really feel like you're missing out a lot on because most of these sessions are just discussions with um, experts in the industry. And it's, it's a good way of uh, you know, also networking and just getting to the right person. Who knows, maybe that person could help you with those uh, tools or calculations because we are not sustainability experts. So uh, highly encouraged. Yeah, um, I'm just going to launch the very last poll, which I forgot about, which is, uh, do you find integrating carbon data, uh, do you find value in integrating carbon data with your 3D models? So if anyone can answer, that'd be great. Uh, and then I guess just to finish off, James, maybe one more question. I know you did answer it in the chat, but um, I don't know if everyone saw it. So how do tools uh, like the one that we've produced that rely on models for quants account for other carbon factors such as logistics and temporary work? So I guess linking that back to, to your work with 4D as well would be quite an interesting thing to look at. Um, yeah, the answer is quite simple. It's just include it within the model. So model it, include it, quantify it, attach it to something. The, the way, the way because we're doing it in 4D, the way we would do it is attach it to tasks. So if you've got an excavator on site on a task for eight weeks and you're planning the project ahead and you, you might want to get that for whatever reason you want, might want to get that down to four weeks or up to 12 weeks, it multiplies. So if you've got 15 excavators, 20 tower cranes, you're attaching it to time. And as you plan things, you're getting a result. So it's, it's complicated. It's, it's still, a lot of us are kind of breaking new ground on this. So like, like the databases, like the libraries, still a work in progress, but yeah, it's, it's part of what we're doing in zero, as Mia says, is kind of discussing these things and seeing what's new and what the solutions look like. Yeah, and I would say as well, we do have a client who's created, so the dashboard that me has created is designed to be a template as a starting point and a jumping off point to, to start from. And we have got a client who's taken that and taken it to the next level, really, and added kind of logistics information from P6 directly into um, Power BI. So then when the model updates, the P6 updates or anything updates, the, the whole thing's linking back. Um, so yeah, there's multiple, multiple ways of doing it. Okay, uh, I think we've got through pretty much all of the questions now. I'll just have a quick check. There's nothing. Uh, actually, there's one one last one that I would like to cover. Can Go we as a carbon footprint phase by phase in 3D repo, something like 4D visualization? I think that's a very interesting use case. It also depends on the data that you have, but it's worth mentioning that we do have a 4D option, uh, which uh, in which we allow you to upload your 4D sequences 
and you can visualize this. So why not append those, you know, carbon issues or, you know, information back to your sequences? So there's definitely some work to be done around this use case. So if you're interested, I would say definitely get in touch and we can talk about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that, is that, uh, I've got a jump right now. So thanks very much. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Thanks Thank very you. much, guys. Cheers for attending. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.